Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you all for joining us today for a conversation on the filibuster. I'm Molly Reynolds. I'm here with my colleague, Sarah Binder. Uh, we are both senior fellows in the Governance Studies Program at Brookings, and Sarah is also a professor of political science at George Washington University. We've both written books on the filibuster. Uh, Sarah's, written with Steve Smith, is entitled Politics or Principle, and mine, which focuses on the way the Senate has gotten around the filibuster, is entitled Exceptions to the Rule. We're going to spend about 30 minutes today answering some common questions about the filibuster. Uh, for those of you who submitted questions in advance, thank you. And we'll cover a lot of the ground that you were curious about in our conversation. Uh, then we'll turn to more audience questions. If you're watching live, you can submit a question by emailing events at brookings.edu or via Twitter by using the hashtag filibuster101. So let's get started. Sarah, uh, can you start us off by talking a little bit about the origins of the filibuster? Where did it come from uh, and how has it developed over time? Sure, thanks Molly and thanks everybody uh, for joining us. So I think it's important when we think about the origins of the filibuster to first make clear what is a filibuster. And it really is any effort to stop the Senate from coming to a vote on the underlying matter, whether an amendment, a motion, a nomination, whatever it is the blocking of taking a vote in the Senate. So in the House today, we don't have filibusters really because the House has a special rule known as the previous question motion. Fancy procedural mumbo jumbo, what does it mean? It means a majority when it's ready can vote to cut off debate. So the question is, if you look at the Senate rules today, they don't have mo majority cloture. They don't have a previous question motion. So. How do we get the situation where the Senate allows filibusters and the House does not? Well, start 1789. Both chambers actually had in their own separate rule books a motion called the previous question motion. But there was a hitch back in 1789 and for the first decade or so of the new Congress, it did not have the effect of cutting off debate. Uh, it did some other things. In fact, sometimes when it was used, it postponed debate which was, of course, or postponed the issue, which is the opposite of cutting off debate. So it's 1805, uh, Aaron Burr, vice president, uh, has shot and murdered uh, Alexander Hamilton the year before. Uh, and Aaron Burr uh, is giving a farewell speech to the Senate because he's still the vice president, still presiding. And he says, look, you are a great deliberative body, but your rule look is a little messy. And he proceeds to give some advice. And we don't have verbatim records of what he said, but we have memoirs that roughly tell us. He said, look, you've got rules that do the same thing, motions to postpone, previous question motion. You could drop the previous question motion. And in 1806, we can tell the Senate codified its rules and the previous question motion is gone. Now, that was probably not noticed at the time because it hadn't been used as majority cloture. And over in the House, it takes several more years, 1811, till they turn their previous question motion into a majority measure to cut off debate. Filibusters uh, begin to emerge in, this, in the Senate in the 1830s, 1840s. Why? There is no previous question motion in the rule book to cut off debate. So I think it's fair to call the origins of the filibuster, in essence, the unintended consequence. We might even call it a mistake of a procedural motion even if senators did not understand, could not have understood probably what they were doing then. So just what happens? We get filibusters. We get them on all sorts of issues. <laughs> we get them 19th century, we get them 20th century. Uh, we get them over race and slavery and civil rights, but we also get them over just partisan issues. Who should be the printer of the Senate, right? Who should get this appointment? How much money should we spend? Uh, the Bank of the United States, anything and everything was fair game for senators willing to debate. Now today, there's been a lot of talk about talking filibusters. Let's return to the great era where, this the reformers say, where senators went to the floor and they talked and talked and offered motions until you wore out the other side. But I think it's worth, maybe we should spend a little time on the talking filibuster. Like what happened to it, Molly? Like what is it? What was it? What's the What's this silent filibuster? Can we bring it back? What would happen? 
all yours. Yeah. <laughs> so those are all, those are all great questions. Um, and certainly ones that we are hearing a lot brought up um, by President Biden, um, by others, um, both inside and outside the chamber who are thinking about reforms um, to uh, to the rules. So, you know, what happened to the talking filibuster? So Sarah has given us some of the history um, through kind of the early part of the 19th century. Um, uh, we'll, I think, maybe come back to some of the sort of history between the middle part of the 19th century and about 1970, the early 1970s, which is where I'm going to start uh, with my answer to Sarah's question, come back and talk about like, how do we get the cloture rule in the first place. Um, but in the early 1970s, um, in part because the Senate's workload was growing. So, you know, we have coming out of especially the New Deal, um, just a more active federal government, more things for Congress to be doing, um, more and more work on the Senate's plate. Um, Mike Mansfield, who's the, the majority leader working with um, Robert Byrd, I think we'll probably come back to Robert Byrd at some point when we talk about reconciliation in a little bit. Um, but they kind of worked out an arrangement working with the minority party, with the Republicans, um, to um, allow for several pieces of legislation to be pending on the floor at the same time as, un as unfinished business. Um, this meant that when something was being filibustered, rather than someone needing to go to the floor and keep talking, um, it the, the thing being filibustered, the thing being obstructed could just be set aside rather than having to be um, kind of dispensed with um, uh, as long as um, senators kind of agreed to, to this arrangement. Um, importantly, this made engaging in obstruction much less costly for senators. Instead of having to sort of actively engage in uh, speaking or otherwise offering dilatory motions or holding things up on the floor, senators could engage in what um, Sarah referred to as a, a more silent filibuster. Something really indicate that they were, um, they intended to obstruct um, something. Um, by making uh, the act of engaging in obstruction less costly, less demanding um, for, uh, for senators. Um, and there are other changes in the political environment that are happening here at, this, at the same time. Um, and together, those kind of increase the incentive for individual senators to, um, to engage in obstruction. But really importantly, it became easier for an individual senator or group of senators to, um, to engage in this sort of obstruction um, on the floor uh, once we moved away from um, a, a, talking, um, a talking filibuster. So Folks often are curious, you know, would this work? Would um, some kind of um, return to the talking filibuster um, really change the way uh, the Senate works? And I think it's important to note that um, it probably wouldn't require an actual change to the Senate's rules um, to, to do this. It would really just more likely involve a change to the way the Senate um, operates, um, the way uh, Majority Leader Schumer kind of manages the, the institution. Uh, but to my mind, it's really unclear sort of whether it would, whether it would work. <laughs> um, here are a couple things to, to keep in mind. So first of all, even in a world where the minority party, members of the minority party, if they're obstructing something the majority party wants to do, um, even where they have to kind of talk um, at length on the Senate floor, they actually have an incentive to use that Senate floor time for attention. <laughs> I mean, if we think we don't often see this kind of extended speechifying in the contemporary Senate, we see it sometimes. And it's important to kind of think about some of those examples from recent years and remind ourselves of, you know, what was the purpose? Um, why did a Senator choose to do that? So things like, um, so um, uh, several years ago, Senator Chris Murphy of Connecticut went to the floor and um, uh, spoke for um, many hours um, in on uh, gun control issues, uh, an issue on which she's been very active. And, and the the purpose of that was in part to try to get um, to cure uh, secure a uh, promise for a couple of votes um, to, to happen on the Senate floor, but it's also really to draw a lot of attention to the issue that he cared a lot about. And so if you're if you're thinking about members of the minority party, so currently the, the Republicans, if you make them talk, they actually have an incentive to use that talking to, to fundraise and to otherwise draw attention um, to whatever issue they're, they're trying to block. And I think the incentive to really dig in and, and actually talk as long as possible might be especially high on that first attempt by 
Democrats to force Republicans to actually engage in a talking filibuster, in part to prove that it's, or try and prove that that strategy, that approach to running the Senate is not especially viable over the kind of short or medium term. It's also important to remember that making the minority talk is actually costly to the majority as well. So um, as kind of an operational matter, if you know, it's the middle of the night, it's 3 a.m., the majority is making the minority actually go to the floor and speak in order to, um, to effectuate the, the filibuster. That person um, in the minority party who's speaking could look around, say, hey, there's not a quorum present um, in the Senate right now. There's not the, the minimum required number of senators to um, conduct business. Raise, um, say, you know, say I, um, uh, there, there's not a quorum here. And then the majority would actually have to produce um, uh, a quorum in order to um, keep the Senate's business going. Um, and so that's that's a sort of physical cost to the majority. Their members actually would need would to be need to be nearby. And then there's an opportunity cost. The longer you let the minority use the uh, sort of hold the floor speaking about one issue, that's time floor time you're not using um, for for something else. Um, Lastly, on this question of kind of would it work, um, it's also not entirely clear, I think, um, under some of the kind of current conversation around this idea of restoring the talking filibuster, how debate would actually end um, if the return to a talking filibuster is not accompanied by some change to the number of votes needed to, um, to invoke cloture. So if the idea is you try and, as the majority, force the minority to keep talking, once they tire of speaking, if you've kind of outlasted them to that point, have you reached a point where you still need to file what's called a cloture motion, which is the, the way that um, the Senate currently has available to it to end, to end debate? Do you still need to get 60 votes to, um, to invoke cloture? That, those, are, those questions are um, a little unclear, I think, often when we sort of raise the specter of returning um, to, the, to the talking filibuster and actually provides, I think, a pretty useful segue into the next question that I have for Sarah, which is um, given kind of this uncertainty about whether returning to the talking filibuster would work, what are some other actions the Senate has for curtailing the filibuster? When has the Senate changed its practices in the past? Um, sure. So uh, I think it's always important to keep in mind that the this question of debate and reform, and particularly filibuster reform, that is an age-old question. It's an age-old problem, and it's an age-old challenge uh, for the Senate, right? We can go back 19th century and find 19th century leaders uh, trying to get the Senate to impose and to create uh, limits on debate. Uh, when Steve Smith and I, back a quarter century ago, we were doing our book, uh, Digging Through the Political History of the Filibuster, and trying to pinpoint particular leaders, the great Senate leaders who we recognize and, and celebrate as sort of the great uh, debaters, you know, Henry Clay, Daniel Webster, right? they all favored limits on debate. And of course, every time they proposed a limit, it would be filibustered. So I think it's important to keep in mind that reform efforts today come on the end of a long, right, or a stopping point on a long history. And I would say a long, slow march towards essentially majority rule, right? Whether they ever get real majority rule uh, on this legislative, get rid of the legislative filibuster so that you can't uh, filibuster uh, legislation, we don't know. And if they can get there, when? That we don't know. But the long movement here is towards sometimes small, sometimes larger changes like banning nomination, uh, nomination filibusters. So what would it take? Um, I think there are at least, there are many challenges, but there are at least two, I think, to keep uh, keep our eyes on. And first, obviously, is um, most people, uh, even our colleagues who are political scientists, aren't experts on rules and, and don't spend a lot of time thinking about rules. And most Americans don't spend a lot of time thinking about rules. I think they spend more time today uh, just because of sort of nationalization of politics and more 24-7 coverage and the, the quality of the press corps that goes <laughs> narrow and deep sometimes into these issues. Um, but it typically takes the forging of a policy issue around which uh, the filibuster has been blocking progress. 
Uh, it's been national security around World War I, and that was the point at which the Senate majority created its first cloture rule in 1917. The question was, were these 11 willful men who were blocking a particularly important bill for the war effort? Uh, they did several years in a row until Woodrow Wilson, as president, pinpointed them and said the national security depends on creating the cloture rule. So they created compromising between the majority cloture folks and the super, super majority cloture folks. They created a two thirds vote to cut off, cut off debate. So it's been national security. It's been civil rights has been a focal point. Uh, and so then not surprisingly, much of the democratic movement today is focused around voting rights, right? Is voting rights so important to both congressional Democrats and more broadly Democrats uh, and perhaps others uh, outside the Congress that enough would 50 senators rally together to think about rules changes in order to secure uh, voting rights. So that's the first challenge. Like what is the policy issue that's going to attract and uh, be sufficient to get 50 Democratic senators when we know today we don't, Democrats don't have that uh, in order uh, to even make any type of change, we, at least we think, to, uh, to the filibuster rule. There's a second challenge though, which is really, uh, how are you going to reform the rules? And this gets into, we have a couple of questions uh, from the audience about the nuclear option. What does that mean? Well, to actually change the rules, and here we're typically talking about rule 22, which is the cloture rule. If you follow literally the rules, there's a large high threshold for cutting off a filibuster of efforts to reform the filibuster. So it takes a two thirds vote to cut off debate on a measure or motion related to changing the rules. Well, we know we've seen the ban of nomination filibusters, the ban of Supreme Court nomination filibusters, and it's been done with the majority vote. So there's another way to do it. And that's what we now tend to call the nuclear option. So what does that mean? Instead of technically following the, the procedural path dictated by the rules, it means that a majority decides to reinterpret the rules to set what we call a precedent. The and majority set precedents on all aspects of the Senate because the rules can't tell us, right? Every single episode, we don't know how to apply them in every single circumstance. So when Democrats uh, went nuclear uh, in 2013, they reinterpreted the rule 22. What do we mean by reinterpret? The rule says it takes 60 votes to cut off debate on a nomination. A majority of the Senate decided 60 means just a simple majority. Republicans in 2017, when they decided to nuke Supreme Court filibusters, they reinterpreted what was left of that part of Rule 22 to say supermajority cloture actually means simple majority. Now, it sounds kind of crazy pants. I mean, this is the Senate, and much of the Senate is not written in rules. It's written in the precedents and practices, which is, well, I'm sure we'll get to this when we talk about uh, reconciliation. That's why the advice of the parliamentarian is so important. Somebody has to do the work of trying to, to interpret. And the majority of the Senate can always decide, do we like that interpretation or do we want a new one? So where are we here? Uh, Democrats have two, two challenges. One, are, is there a set of procedural reforms that they could agree on? And there's only 50 of them and they will need 50 plus the vice president. And if so, do they agree on doing it through the nuclear option? And they're not, they're not there yet, right? And there's just the interview with uh, Senator Sinema today from Arizona who said, well, we need to change behavior. We don't need to change the rules. And I think she and probably Senator Manchin as well, who's been a little more open to the concept of uh, reforming the rules, neither of them, and my guess is several other Democrats at this point, mm, don't seem on board for the nuclear, uh, nuclear route. So, well, of course, whenever Democrats here in this case, talk about pursuing the nuclear option, it raises uh, threats of retaliation from Republicans. So uh, Molly, you want to tell us a little bit about like what do we make of the threats that Mitch McConnell as Republican leader has replied uh, to the Democrats? Uh, what are those threats about? What would, he's talked about scorched earth. 
Senate? Like, what would that look like? <laughs> and then maybe we can talk a little bit about like what other options are there for the Democrats in particular, this question of stretching uh, reconciliation into greater, uh, more purposes. Yeah, so uh, Minority Leader McConnell has recently said, you know, if Democrats eliminate the legislative filibuster, he's going to go scorched earth um, on, on the Senate. Like, um, there, and there are certainly things that McConnell and Republicans could do if they wanted to, to really throw sand in the gears of the Senate's routine day-to-day -day operations. They could object to, for example, very routine unanimous consent requests. So one other kind of secret of the Senate is that Sarah's just kind of walked us through the Senate's rule book, um, the Senate's precedents, but lots of things that happen on a daily basis in the Senate happen simply because the Senator says, I ask unanimous consent to do so-and-so, no one objects, and then the Senate goes on about its, about its day. And if Republicans wanted to, they really could slow down a lot of the kind of routine operations of the Senate. I think folks who were kind of watching the debate over the American Rescue Plan um, uh, back in February and March, probably remember Senator Ron Johnson of Wisconsin um, objecting to a unanimous consent request to waive the reading of the entire substitute amendment text um, on the floor. That's the sort of thing that they, they could do if they really wanted to, to slow things down. Importantly, I would expect that if Republicans tried to do that and really kind of grind the Senate to a halt, like Democrats would probably find a way to at least try to respond. So Sarah was talking before about some changes that were made to the precedents um, around the number of votes needed to end debate on nominations, first in 2013 and then again in 2017. There's another um, precedent change that happened in 2019 that I think is um, sort of illustrative of this um, kind of one party does something, um, the other party responds procedurally, and then the the party in the majority takes a, another step. And that's, uh, so in 2019, we saw Republicans um, uh, change the precedence for the amount of time uh, after which cloture has been invoked, so after which debate has been ended on um, uh, many uh, nominations, not all nominations, uh, but they made a change to, to reduce the amount of time available for post cloture consideration um, from um, uh, brought it down from 30 hours um, in response to um, Democrats having kind of refused to waive that um, that 30 hour post cloture consideration requirement in many cases. So I think that's a good recent example of kind of what we might, the sort of thing that we might expect, even if um, Republicans kind of really dug in and, and tried to um, try to slow down the Senate in response to a change um, by, by Democrats. It's also, I think, important to remember that uh, McConnell has made these kinds of threats before and then not entirely followed through on them, though that could certainly change if, um, you know, this were seen as a change to the filibuster now was seen as kind of higher profile or high, a higher threat. And it's also worth remembering that part of why the Senate operates as it does now currently is because predictability and certainty about what's going to happen on the floor is in the shared interest of individual senators. And the the current set of individual senators, I think, largely believes that the benefits of ceding power to their party leaders to manage the floor exceeds the costs to them of doing that. And, and I just don't know how willing members would be to kind of upset, <clears throat> excuse me, the whole apple cart. Um, uh, if um, uh, even if, if Democrats um, did make this change um, to the filibuster. Um, another sort of question that kind of comes up in, in this um, vein that I'll, um, I will turn to before I talk a little bit about, um, about reconciliation is this question of, you know, what would Democrats re regret making, um, making a change to, um, to the filibuster now? I um, mean, and certainly this is a concern. Um, I think it's important to remember that there is a, um, uh, a difference between, Sarah was talking before about the, the linkage that um, majorities in the Senate have made between a particular policy issue and a particular um, uh, a procedural change in the past. Um, and I think there's often a difference between the thing that would kind of break the dam and actually lead a majority, in this case, the Democrats, to um, 
uh, to make a change to the filibuster versus what are the things that then would become easier to pass when the filibuster was no longer in place, um, even if they themselves are not the issue that's high enough salience, has enough agreement to be to be the action for forcing mechanism, the, the thing that that breaks the dam. And so when we think, you know, for for um, for Democrats, for for folks who might be worried about what a future um, Republican majority might do. I think thinking about, well, what are the things that um, where Republicans maybe themselves did not have enough agreement on to to make a, or think was important enough to make a change to the filibuster, but might flow through, flow down that legislative river more easily if the filibuster um, wasn't in place. Um, and so it, it's, it's also possible that the next time Republicans find themselves in unified party control of Washington, there is an issue for which they would be willing to eliminate the filibuster. Um, there does not appear to have been one um, uh, in the kind of the 2017-2018 the period when um, when Republicans enjoyed unified party control of Washington, that's not to say that there couldn't be one in the future. So that that leaves Democrats with this sort of question of, you know, do we hold um, hold back now when Republicans might themselves not hold back um, in the in the future? Um, the the kind of last thing I'll say on on this question before I talk a little bit about reconciliation is. Um, Depending on sort of the policy in question, um, it's not actually always straightforward whether a different partisan majority in the future would find it easy to roll back what a previous partisan majority had done. So I think the experience of the Affordable Care Act is a really great example of this. So in 2017, Republicans made an attempt to repeal the ACA, which they had been saying they would do if they had unified party control for seven years since the law was originally um, enacted. And then when they had the opportunity to do so and attempted to do so through the reconciliation process, which is not um, subject to a filibuster, they couldn't do it not because the rules were preventing them from doing so, but because they did not have the votes. They, they could not come up with a, a proposal that a majority in the House and a majority in the Senate were willing to vote for. And so um, it, it could be the case that, you know, a Democratic majority now would pass something that a Republican majority in the future would more easily roll back um, if the filibuster was gone. But I think that the, those, um, that's, how likely that is to happen um, varies more by individual policy than I think sometimes we sort of um, uh, assume with a with a broad brush. So, you know, what is reconciliation? Is it a viable alternative? Um, so it's a viable alternative for some major policy changes, but it's not an unlimited tool. So reconciliation is a particular set of legislative procedures that um, can uh, allow for legislating through the Senate without the threat of a, a filibuster, but there are limits. Um, there are limits on what kinds of policies you can use it for. Um, there are limits on what the budgetary effects of those um, changes can be. And relatedly, there are often also limits on how long those changes can um, uh, sort of be in effect for. Um, reconciliation has long been used uh, to make policy changes that are important to the majority party. Um, we can go back to the early 1980s, which is kind of the first use of reconciliation in a way that looks similar to the way it's been um, uh, has been used in more recent years. Um, and it, you know, if we trace that history, we can see lots of examples of um, uh, the Senate using the process to do things that are important to its to the majority party's chances of retaining their majority party status um, in, in the next election. Um, but over time, and I think particularly since 2010, the process has become more central to both parties' prospects of getting big legislative accomplishments, simply because it has become harder to legislate in the presence of the filibuster in other ways. Um, one kind of important thing about the filibuster and whether it's, or excuse me, reconciliation and whether it's a, a viable alternative is there is some imbalance between how much of the kind of Republican agenda and how much of the Democratic agenda I think can be meaningfully accomplished through the process. So on the kind of Republican agenda, um, you know, one of the most important things as we saw in 2017 that Republicans in Congress wanna do is cut taxes. You can do that through the reconciliation process. 
on the Democratic side, you can do a lot of the kinds of things the Democrats want to do um, uh, through the reconciliation process, especially given how much of our social policy is delivered through the tax code, given that you can legislate um, uh, revenue provisions through the through the tax code. There's a lot you can do, um, you know, the, the expansion of the child tax credit in the American Rescue Plan as a way to combat child poverty is a great example of this. But there are also a lot of things that are really important on the um, Democratic uh, agenda that can't be touched by the reconciliation process. Sarah was talking before about voting rights. Um, so I think that that's, um, and there are other examples as well. We, we saw um, uh, back in, um, in February and March, the debate over whether you could raise the federal minimum wage to the reconciliation process. So I think that sort of imbalance um, uh, between, and the asymmetry between the share of the two parties' agendas that um, they can meaningfully enact through the reconciliation process is important as we think about whether it's a, a viable alternative. Um, and so I, I, I uh, we can talk more, I think, um, uh, about kind of the specific way that the debate over the reconciliation process um, is um, is unfolding. Um, I'm gonna sort of pause, uh, pose one question back to, um, Back to Sarah, um, but I'll also remind folks that if you have questions, you can email them to events at workings.edu or um, use the, the hashtag um, filibuster101 on Twitter. But Sarah, one thing that um, you know we were talking about before in terms of ways that the Senate um, could make changes to the, to the filibuster short of um, full abolition, I talked a little bit about the talking filibuster. There are a couple other proposals that we hear about sometimes. Um, could you talk a little bit about some of those and kind of what they are um, and just give our, our viewers a, a sense of what the other options might be. Um, sure. So I think the two things to know about uh, Rule 22, uh, the closure rule, uh, will help us think about what these potential reforms are that have been occasionally over the years um, talked about. Um, two parts here. First is to keep in mind that the closure rule sets the threshold. Is it 60? Is it 51? Is it 67? And in some senses, other than the simple majority, we might call it arbitrary, right? It's typically when they got to 60, it was a power play between the folks who wanted 51 and the folks who wanted to keep it at 67. So one variable is how many votes for cloture? The second variable is if you look into uh, the Senate rule book more broadly, there are what we call debatable motions and non-debatable motions. And the ones that are listed as non-debatable means you can't filibuster them. So there are lots of measures in motion subject to filibusters. So the first question is, what should the cloture threshold be? And to what should it be applied? And if you start to think about Rule 22 in that sense, it, I think, would opens up the possibilities of potential reforms. So one, let's start focusing on the on the, the, what the cloture threshold is itself, the number required to cut off debate. Um, one thing that uh, Steve Smith and I put in our booking book uh, years ago was the notion of ratcheting down uh, the number of votes required for cloture. This is something uh, Senator Tom Harkin uh, had proposed and uh, in fact had proposed it while in the minority in the 1990s. And you can imagine that didn't go over so well with any of his colleagues. But what was his point? His point is, let, let's start at 60 and let's have a set of days pass whereby every time you attempt a cloture motion, if you fail to get 60, wait three days and it goes down, the next challenge will be 57. Wait three days, implement cloture uh, process, uh, it goes down to 54, and then eventually we'll get down to, to 51. So a sliding scale of cloture. Now the way cloture works, um, it, they're built in delays built into it, so in fact, you could have a debate that's stretching over almost two weeks at least before you actually got to the 51. Now, some people would say, well, if everybody knows what's happening at the end, then they're gonna keep voting against cloture. And so isn't that just majority cloture? But of course, part of the argument from the opposition party is we want to have debate, often opposition party senators will say, because we want to air the issues and we want to draw more people to our side. And there is some truth, at least if we think about past decades ago filibusters where we used to see that type of negotiations ongoing on the floor, right? Would an amendment make a difference here? Well, let's talk out that amendment for some time. So 
I think there's some value to thinking about, uh, and some senators will say, but maybe we should think about lowering the cloture threshold. Now, the other issue, which would probably be easier for minority party senators uh, to bite on, not to say that they will, but they might, uh, is to try to reduce the number of motions and the type of motions subject to filibusters. So several years ago, there was an agreement between the parties, which has stuck, uh, to lower the, reduce the number of motions it takes to get into, into conference with the, with the House. Um, there are three separate motions, <laughs> because this is the Senate. Uh, well, there's several in the House too, so to be fair to the, to the Senate. There are three, they basically condense them down to one. You can still filibuster it, but now we don't have potentially three filibusters just to get a bill, which is the Senate has already passed to get to conference. I think the number one issue where reformers have talked more about is eliminating the filibuster of the motion to proceed to a bill. So not the amendment on the bill, not the bill itself, but hey, Senate, are we ready to have a vote on the motion to proceed to a bill, call it up, set the agenda? So that might be a way or an area or the target where perhaps there's a supermajority, perhaps, especially if Republicans today thought Democrats actually had the votes to go nuclear, that might not be a credible threat. But if they were, perhaps they'd be willing to lower the temperature by essentially giving to the Democratic majority here the chance to actually set the agenda by putting gun rights, immigration, gun control, and so forth onto, this, onto the Senate floor. And perhaps in exchange for having some type of agreement where the minority party is guaranteed amendments on the floor um, so that the majority wouldn't say, okay, now we've got the bill on the floor without a filibuster, now we'll just cut off debate with cloture. So um, there are opportunities here for thinking more creatively about how um, Senate rules might be more responsive uh, to the interests of the majority, assuming that on any of these issues, there are 51 senators uh, for, that, for that issue. Um, just seeing we've got some questions coming down the pike here, oh, we've got some hidden procedural experts. <laughs> um, um, do, you, uh, do you have city you want to? Oh, uh, yes. I'll so, just, yeah. Go ahead, okay, go ahead. Well, I'll just take one here from Marcelo. Do you see a future in which the removal of filibuster is supported by both parties? Um, and I think it's a it's an excellent question, and in part. If we look at what happened when they eliminated nomination filibusters in 2013 by the Democrats, Republicans won back control of the chamber in uh, 2014 elections. And there were, they had uh, conference debates about reinstating nomination filibusters. Now, it didn't make any sense at the time because President Obama, a Democrat, was in the office. So Republicans in the majority just didn't call up any of the nominations. And so, you know, under 20% of the nominees actually got confirmed. So in that sense, it didn't matter that they didn't restore it. But if you listen to what senators were saying, it was just like all of a sudden nomination, uh, the, the idea you couldn't filibuster nominations, it was very quickly absorbed into what I think of as like the, the, the fabric of the Senate. You had like Senator Blunt said, well, of course, of course we have nominations and you can't filibuster. And of course we reserve the filibuster for, for uh, legislative measures, right? It becomes tradition, right? Senators create tradition out of whole cloth. <laughs> and so is it possible that both senator, both parties could come, right? To support a uh, supermajority Senate? It's entirely possible. We don't know that. But senators do rationalize and come to exploit the rules as are presented to them. So I don't think we can rule out that we'd have two majority parties, uh, both uh, appreciating uh, the value to their party and what also the costs and the challenges of, uh, of majority rule. Yeah, so um, I'm gonna take a question that came in from, um, from Twitter um, about reconciliation, uh, which is a question, it's super in the weeds, but you found yourself to the right, in the right place if you, uh, if you have this kind of question about the, the budget reconciliation process. I mean, it's a question about whether there's a deadline for revising the fiscal year 2021 budget resolution um, under the Congressional Budget Act. And what I'm gonna say is, so if you haven't been immersed in Senate parliamentarian news, 
news over the past 24 hours. Um, the kind of context for this question is that um, the reconciliation process, um, so in, um, in February, uh, Democrats in the House and the Senate adopted what's called the budget resolution, which is the necessary first step for uh, initiating uh, a use of the reconciliation process to pass a reconciliation uh, bill. Um, uh, they, they did that with the American Rescue Plan. Uh, Democrats have long said that they intend to use reconciliation to do subsequent um, legislative priorities during this Congress. But there's this question of kind of how many more times can they go to that well? And that that the number of times that they can they can go to that well is constrained in part by the rules of the reconciliation process and what the Senate parliamentarian, whose job it is to kind of advise senators on the interpretation of the rules and precedents, what she says the the kind of previous rules and precedents um, allow um, allow in terms of the number of um, reconciliation um, measures that that you can you can do. And yesterday um, she uh, she advised that um, a revision of the previous budget resolution, the one for fiscal year 2021, um, uh, that could is permitted that could contain new reconciliation instructions. But um, one of the things that um, uh, was was also true when this news broke yesterday is that um, Majority Leader Schumer said that, um, and I'm, I'm I believe quoting here, some parameters still need to be worked out. So exactly what that means and exactly how that will kind of unfold um, is is an open question. And the kinds of things that um, still need to be figured out are like the kinds of things that this questioner is asking about. How long would um, Democrats have to have to to do this, um, how how broad could uh, how sort of what could those instructions that were part of a revised budget resolution look like? And so um, maybe there's been more news while we've been having this conversation, but that's the, that's the sort of thing that kind of um, that, that Schumer meant when he was talking about um, kind of not all the details being worked out. And the, the last thing I'll say on this question of kind of revising um, a budget resolution for an additional bite at the reconciliation apple is that the rules and procedures are constraining here, but they're not the only thing that's constraining here. Writing a reconciliation bill and getting it through all of the very particular procedural hoops of the reconciliation process is a really time consuming um, legislative endeavor. So um, as kind of to ex the analogy folks sometimes use about the reconciliation process is that you only get so many bites of the reconciliation apple to kind of stretch that analogy. Once you've taken a bite, it like takes you some time to eat the apple. Um, and so you have to, you have to write the legislative language. You have to get the House and the Senate to, to agree on the proposal. You have to send it through the very particular legislative, legislative hoops. There's, um, you know, there's, there's, there's debate on the floor. There's lots of amendment votes and um, you have to get the, the two chambers to agree. So you, you only have um, like that, that takes legislative time and it's legislative time that you're focused on, on that particular process that you're not using um, for, something, for something else that, that can't be done um, through the process. Um, I'm going to, I think we have probably about time for one more question. I'm gonna kick it back to, to Sarah and ask another question um, from Twitter um, about uh, what's the, can, uh, could you talk about the history of filling the amendment tree and how that plays into um, filibuster dynamics? Uh, sure. So filling the tree is just uh, the simplest way to think about it is that the majority leader who can be recognized first uh, by practicing precedent on the Senate floor essentially takes up all the opportunities and blocks amendments uh, from being offered. Um, and by the end of the day, depending on how aggressively the majority leader does that, it can preclude both amendments being offered by the minority party but as well amendments being sought by the majority party. And we know that over time, over the last say, starting the late 1990s when it might've been used sparingly, but increasingly over the years since then, that we've had the situation where uh, when and if they can get cloture on the motion for seeing the bills on the floor, the minority accuses the majority of filling the tree quite quickly in order to get to a vote to prevent the minority from reshaping the bill. Majorities will say, we've carefully crafted these proposals, sometimes in a bipartisan fashion in committee, and we wanna protect them, and so we don't want them unraveling on, on the floor. But which, whichever way it is, it adds to the frustration, certainly amongst members of the opposition party, that they've not had an ability to in, uh, effect 
the bill. But at the, at the outset, it, it also uh, leads to grumbling by members of the majority party. And you'll hear it from um, a range of, in this case, Democratic senators and also Republican senators at times that their opportunities to try to make the Senate work just aren't there anymore. But at the end of the day, majority members often just uh, just basically defer to the leader, and as Molly said, look, their lives are more certain. Uh, they know what's going to happen when, and so they're less willing uh, to challenge the leader when uh, when he does this. They'll give consent whenever the leader tries to negotiate consent. So how does this relate to the filibuster? Well, um, as we're ending our debate, our, our time limit here, which is classically how filibusters win in the old days, they adjournment, <laughs> gotta go, sorry guys. Um, so at, at risk of uh, taking time talking about the deadline here, what does it matter here? We're in a world here where the Senate is just not doing much at all on the floor, right? This is not a world of talking filibusters or talking legislators. Um, it's so rare that we can turn to the floor. And we see it on reconciliation in this weird uh, amendment sort of way, but that's not the world we live in. Right. And as Molly pointed to earlier, that's because time is such a scarce commodity. And we knew it in the 80s when we were doing when we saw silent filibusters, but it's in fades today where senators have multiple commitments, parties of commitments. And I'll believe it when I see it, which I hope to <laughs> uh, see some version of, of a talking filibuster. But leaders have to make it a priority on both sides of the aisle. And that's just not where the Senate seems to be today. And on that bright, oh, ooh, we got an ex we got an extension of the adjournment <laughs> from the par advice of the parliamentarian. We have another minute. Um, any final love points, Molly? You wanna? I don't think so. I just want to say thank you to everyone who joined us today, um, and for all the great questions that folks submitted, both in advance and during the the live event. Hopefully, Sarah and I were able to um, clear up some of those some of those questions that that folks have, and I'm sure that over the next several months, we'll be having more conversations um, about, about this topic. So thank you all for joining us today. Um, and uh, we, we appreciate you watching. Thanks for watching. Be sure to like and subscribe for more videos from Brookings.